things, you know, we had decided to, we set up this webinar for, to help parents, you know, COVID-19 has hit the whole world. A lot of industries, are, sectors and industries are hit. And more importantly, the education sector, especially in our side of the world. And, you know, having parents and children at home during the um, total lockdown was, was quote and unquote, a bit easy. But now we have parents, some parents have to work, some parents at home, you know, how do parents navigate in the, the dynamics of that? It's the reason why we have set up this webinar. And with me, I have uh, a brilliant mind. I've known her for over a decade and I know her to be excellent at what she does. She's an educator. Her name is Kachi. Thank you, Kachi, for joining us. Thank you very much, Suri, for having me. Amazing. How have you been? I mean, how is Corona COVID treating you? <laughs> Enjoying the indoors. Thankfully, my husband was stuck indoors as well. He was not, um, <laughs> he travels a lot, so he happened to be at home when it all struck. So I've actually been enjoying myself. Yeah. <laughs> so, Kachi, um, let us meet you and then, you know, um, you know, talk to us about homeschooling. You know, what is homeschooling? How can parents navigate their way around all that is happening to ensure that their children do not um, lag behind educationally? Okay, <clears throat> excuse me, please. Hi everyone, once again, I'm Onye Kachi. I'm a teacher, an educator, and um, I work with parents as well as a consultant on parenting issues. Okay. Um, homeschooling. Homeschooling is, is basically children learning at home. So instead of going to school, they're learning at home. Okay. There's also home learning really, which is what most people are doing. So it's an interim, an interim thing where we're just learning for the time being at home, pending when schools resume. Okay. So Homeschooling, home learning is a very, very strong and important factor. It's not easy to achieve, really. It's never easy to achieve, but um, it is achievable. And uh, parents achieving it really depends on them. It depends on how worth it you know, they think it is. Um, it depends on the value they place on it, okay? So um, I'll just go straight into uh, the, my slides and then go delve a bit off the slides at, at some point. Okay, yes, we're parents, we're working. I'm working as well. <laughs> I'm a teacher, I'm also working. And um, I have children who are getting some work from school. And I know it's really, really difficult to manage both ends, managing the, your deadlines at work, and then the assignments that your children have been given. And then there's the issue of timing. My time is not suitable for my children. My children's time is not suitable for me. There's also the issue of you have a meeting and you have a child screaming into the room <laughs> during the meeting. Okay, so all parents, we are familiar with these um, issues and it could be frustrating, but, 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 we could also work it out and actually come to a very beautiful harmony that would lead us to a peaceful, you know, growing to peaceful growing up years of our children, to be honest. Okay. Let me start. Um, um, the first slide. Okay, so is it really worth it? I think that's the first step for every parent. It's the first step for every parent. Do you think it's worth it to homeschool your child? Do you think the stress will be worth it? Okay. Um, for most parents right now, they're looking at simply achieving the academic um, requirements for their children. But you see, it goes way beyond that. It goes way beyond that. And that's what I like to make parents see. It goes way beyond them just passing exams or passing the tests or being idle away. 
it's way beyond that. It's more of developing a work ethic. It's more of developing some grit, which is very important. It's more a matter of developing some work values and ethics in the children, which is what will take them all through their growing up years. Okay, so for example, and I read an article um, not so long ago about the future skills needed for children, the skills that will be needed in the future, basically, not for children, for adults and all. And the number one by this company was a, an HR Inc. HR Inc., I believe that's the company. <laughs> Excuse me, sorry. The number one for them was, they said, if people will need to be mental gymnasts. So they said, the way you have a gymnast being able to manipulate their bodies and do a lot of things, you know, bend this way, bend that way, jump this way, in your mind as an individual, in the future, you will need to be able to do everything. You should be able to do um, maths. It's not like this day we say, no, I don't like maths, I'm going to do law. He said in the future, it won't be so. So everything will be interwoven. You must know how to do this. You must know how to do that. You must be able to learn a new thing in a few weeks. You must be able to unlearn something old in a few weeks. In fact, they said the half-life for every career in the next 20 years or so, the half-life for a career will be six years. So after six years, the career might be redundant. That's what it means. And whoever is in that career might have to learn a new career. Mm. Now that's the future your children are going into. Within this COVID period, people are already like, whoa, my brain is this, I, I'm too tired, I'm frustrated, I can't cope, you know. But imagine a future where you'll be making constant career changes. Not just you now, but your children. Because to an extent, we the parents will be established in something or the other. But they will just be getting into that stage where they're making decisions. And their decision might have to change in six years and in another six years, and in another six years. Are we building that strength, that grit in them, that you know, ability to work under any circumstance, to learn under any circumstance, to push themselves and achieve whatever it takes? I think that's a bigger vision. And so when we're thinking, oh, no, I can't do it. These schools are just trying to um, take money from people. No, I don't have the time. Please, I'll just wait till they resume. Think of this as well and decide, is it really worth it, okay? I think for my children, it's, it's much more than worth it, even if it's just to get that grit. In fact, for me, it's just to get that grit, to be honest. I'm not even following the school assignment schedule and all that, but I want him to understand that, no, you, you're going to work. You're going to be able to work under any emotional circumstance or physical circumstance you find yourself. You'll be able to work, push yourself and come out better. That's the goal for me. Okay. Um, let's go to the next slide. So I, I want all parents to really think about that. Think about it and decide. Once you make the decision that it's worth it, everything becomes easier for you. And that's the truth. Okay. Now on to, <clears throat> on to some basic tips that will help us um, really achieve homeschooling because yes we understand it's not an easy feat it's not um, something that you will just you know find it in and say oh yeah I'm, I'm doing it well really everyone is just learning it but there are some tips so my first tip here will be for you to carry us for us because i'm also working and i'm also doing all these things to carry out an inventory of our time so um this season calls for a lot of rethinking, replanning, every other thing we had planned before has almost fallen through the drain. Um, for me, I don't know if it's not for others, then good for you. But for me, every other thing I've planned before is sort of you no know, like falling through the drain and I'm having to make new plans. And so for now, I'm having to take an inventory of my time. What time will I best work? In fact, this period I've realized that maybe because because we're not really exerting ourselves physically, although now some people have resumed work, so we'll get to that. But uh, we were not, we're not um, exerting ourselves physically, so I found that my sleep time was even adjusted, kind of. I couldn't sleep till like 12 at some point, then later it came back, you know, to like 10. 
you know, but taking an inventory of your time, what time will you work best? What time will be best for you to achieve your own work goals? Because that's very important. Your work targets, your work deadlines, what time will be best for you to achieve them? If you're a night timer like me, I love to work at night. I go to bed early, wake up quite early in the wee hours of the morning and that's my best time to do anything. Some people it's during the day. You know, now taking an inventory of your, your time will help you to make a schedule for the family, which will come to, okay? So when you know that if, for example, if you work best during the day, you can plan that your children have a nap time at the time you want to work, or they're going out to do some outdoor games or play at the time you want to work, okay? So that's why it's important for you to take an inventory. Also, you need to consider how long it takes for you, you to achieve tasks. How long would you be efficient at your job? How long would you be efficient at doing any other task? You have to think about what tasks you will need to delegate. Will I have to get someone to clean around? Will I have to order someone to get things from the market? You know, order um, some things, groceries from the market. So I don't waste my time trying to get to the shop, join the long queues and all of that. You need to take an inventory of your time. Okay, um, the next tip would be to plan a family schedule. Now you're not just planning for yourself, you are planning for your family because this is not just about you. Okay, so if your spouse is around, your spouse can chip in. Please, please, please don't think you are superwoman or superman. This affects women a lot, though. A lot of women feel it's my job, it's my responsibility. I think we need to come out of that. We need to come out of that. It's not the children are never your responsibility alone. They're for yourself and your spouse. And there are some things you might not get if you don't ask for it or you don't all come to sit down and discuss it. Okay, so you plan your schedule. Oh. Sweetheart, what times are your meeting? What time is my meeting? Is there a free time that you'll be able to spend with the kids? Can I, when will be my free time to spend with the kids? You know, let it be a partnership, all right? As much as possible. If you are on your own though, you still plan a family schedule around yourself, your children, and if there's any other adults around, maybe if you have a nanny or a mother around, um, you plan a family schedule around all that, okay? So the next tip, which is one that African families um, miss out. Okay, this is a quote. Yes, it is a tip to help when planning your schedule. It says, we are not trying to do school at home. So people make that mistake. In fact, schools have made that mistake. Schools think they're trying to do the same thing you do at school, but now at home. No, you're trying to homeschool. They're two entirely different propositions. We're not trying to replicate the time, style, or content of the classroom. So you might not schedule, um, say, 8 to 9, maths, 9 to 10, English, 10 to 11, break, 11 to 12, science. You might not have to do something like that. It could be as flexible as you want it. It could be 15 minutes of work and 30 minutes of play, and then another 15 minutes of work. It could be your fact your child's school time could begin at 2 p.m. If you have lots of meetings to do in the morning and you don't think they'll be effective during the morning since you won't be around. You can make it as flexible as possible, okay? The idea is this, they are at home, let them learn something all through the day. It's not about the formal portion of teaching. That's just a little part of it. And we'll get to that where your child has to achieve independence in every other aspect, not just in the schoolwork, not just in um, the homeschooling or the home learning, but in every aspect of their being, they are going to achieve independence. Okay, <laughs> so to the next tip, which is for you to have a family discussion. This is what is missing in lots of African homes. So we grew up in homes where, <coughs> excuse me, we grew up in homes where daddy came and said, this is the rule. Or mommy came and said, this is the rule. This is what we're going to be doing from now henceforth. And if we would think back, 
We will remember that every time mommy and daddy came, I said, in fact, from now on, nobody is, nobody is bringing a visitor to the house. Think back on how you felt. If you were a good child, you simply grumbled. If you were a naughty child, you made up your mind to bring a friend when mommy and daddy were not around. And, you know, feeling big, like, oh, my friend came to the house, you know. The idea is this, making rules and pushing it down your children's throat always brings up feelings of rebellion or simply feelings of being unfair, of you being unfair. So it's always, it's always, it's been proven that if children take part in making the decision or if they feel they are part of it, okay, then they will actually stick to those decisions. So you don't just come and say from now on, we're homeschooling, the school has resumed, school term is on, you cannot just be playing anyhow. And so from now on, from eight to 10, we are working. Don't do it that way. You sit them down and say, okay, normally we should be in school. There's a lot of learning to do. It's important that we learn. Why do we think it's important that we learn? You can go on and talk to them about how it works, why it's important to learn. You can talk to them how that you have resumed work as well and how you are learning. And let everybody talk about how, in fact, we should ask our children how the coronavirus is affecting them because it is affecting them. Having to stay at home for two months is not easy for a child. It's, in fact, it's more difficult for a child than for the adults. So have a discussion on how all this has affected them. You know, let it just be a, come to this point of, um, it's like a democracy, and then you bring it up. Okay, so now I have to work and I think you have to work as well. So can we think about how we make this work? What time should we all resume our work? I have meetings for eight. I know you might be sleeping at that time. What time do you think would be best? You do this. Now, don't think this is just for older kids. This works for older kids and younger kids. Yes, <coughs> excuse me. My daughter, as, long, as young as three years old, takes part in the, such discussions and brings up her own, okay, I'm going to work because I don't want, <laughs> okay, I told them something about neurons and how that um, if they don't learn, the neurons in their head keeps dancing. <laughs> so she said, okay, she doesn't want the neurons in her head to just dance anyhow. So she's going to work every day. And I realized that after that discussion with her, getting her to do her schoolwork was easier. She would grumble, she still grumbles till today, till tomorrow, when I say, oh, it's time to work, she says, oh, I want to play. But she grumbles to the table, to her desk, picks up her pencil and does work. Because for her, it's her decision. It's not my decision. It's her decision. So that's the importance of having a family discussion. Please get off that African mentality of just, I'm the Lord of all. You know, sit the children down, speak with them, I like to tell parents to think of their children or their home the way they would think of their office. If you're a manager or you're a business owner, how would you speak to your staff about something? You don't just come and say, this is this. Some people do, but you don't get the best results. You take time to you know, meet with them, try to give them options or try to let them see your point of view. But it's basically a discussion, a communication. So you do that with your family as well, with your children, every single child, no matter how young or how old, it's important. Okay, to the next tip. Okay, practice positive discipline. Now we can't exhaust this in this. Um, this is a book, I have the book, I have a very old copy. I read it a lot, I mean a lot, a lot. It's, it's a resource that I treasure. I really treasure this book. Okay, positive discipline. So um, discipline is not about making children scared of you. Discipline is actually about um, getting the children to know what to do at the right time. And then they actually do that. That's actually the meaning of discipline. So as an adult, if you think of a disciplined adult, you're saying that that adult does the right thing at the right time, sticks to their own opinion, you know, no matter what happens, the adult is going to be at the meeting at such and such time. You say, oh, that adult is disciplined. That's actually what it means even for your children. So if you're going to achieve that, it's not just by um, using the 
punishment and all that. Not that um, we can't use them. I'm not saying don't use them, but there is a more effective way. It's called positive discipline. So I'll just share, I think, two or three things from there. It's, it's, if you can get the book, please get the book. If you can, get it, get it, get it, get it. Okay, now the, in the book, they say, and not as the book research, says you use consequences instead of punishments. Um, let me give you a good example. This happened just today, from yesterday to today. So my son has been complaining and saying he wants a break from work, from his schoolwork and all that. And I've tried to explain to him that if you take a break today, because the schoolwork keeps coming, your work will simply pile up. And he's been saying hey, he will do it on one day. He will dedicate one day to complete all the work. I've tried to explain and persuade him. He has refused. So Friday, he didn't do anything. Today, he didn't do anything. He said, no, I should not allow him. And I deliberately allowed him. By tomorrow, I will, today I showed him all the work that was left for him. <laughs> By tomorrow, we would sit down and try to complete all that work. And the idea is this, it's a consequence. It happens to us as adults. If I decide I'm not going to clear my desk today, I want to do it tomorrow. What happens is tomorrow I'm doing both yesterday's work and today's work. I might have to stay longer at the office. It happens to us all. Or we decide that this weekend, I just want to rest. I'm not doing anything. What happens is by Monday, our desk is full and we are stressing ourselves out trying to clear up old log or old baggage. Now that's a consequence. It's not a punishment. Your boss did not come and say, you did not do work today. So I'm bringing 10 times more work. It's not a punishment. It's just a natural consequence. The work just keeps piling. So now for him, I don't need to say, you didn't do your work yesterday. You didn't do your work today. In fact, I'm going to what no, spank you or tell you to kneel down. You know, that won't be as effective as him just knowing that one day we'll sit down with this work and we'll do it tomorrow. When he sits down with the work and he gets tired and he's sleeping off at the work, then I will talk to him again. I say, you see, you left this work. Now you're going to have to complete it whichever time, whatever time you end your work. Maybe you won't have TV all through tomorrow. Maybe you won't be able to play your games all through tomorrow, but you just have to complete your work whichever way. And once he has this experience, trust me, tomorrow, no one will teach him that he needs to do his work at the right time. And that's where discipline comes. Okay, so discipline is not because mommy is going to punish me. Ah, mommy will punish you if you don't do it. That's fear. That's not discipline. Because they will go out to the real world and mommy is not there. And what's going to happen? They say, ah, mommy is not here, so I'm not doing anything. I'm, not, I'm just going to play. And that's what happened to a lot of us when we first got to university, if you think back. So a lot of us did poorly in our first semester in university because nobody was there to tell you, go and read, go and do this. And we just felt, oh, for the first time in our life, we are free. We played it all the way and we had the result. That was a consequence. But we could have had that way back when we were younger. And then when we get to university, it's not a new thing. We understand consequences. So <laughs> in the book, the book about positive um, discipline, teaches that you should use consequences more often than you use punishments. So what's the consequence for not doing your work now? You just get more work and more work and more work. What's the consequence for not doing your chores? Your room gets so messy and one day we say, oh, you can't do anything until you clean up your room. And by the time it takes you a full day to clean up, you see the child down and tell the child, look, if you have been doing it every day, you wouldn't have spent this long in this, okay? Um, so yeah, basically use more consequences than punishment. Then it talks about using rewards to motivate a child. Some children are naturally motivated, yes. Some children are externally motivated. Some children look like they cannot be motivated at all. I've met children, <laughs> I've met children like that. Okay, they are not so um, common, but they are, they are children that look like they can't be motivated at all. You know what, the truth to those type of children, there's usually one thing that will motivate them one thing. And when that motivation comes, it's going to be from the inside, not from anything on the outside. But there are lots of children who can be motivated externally. So you use rewards. Okay, so um, there are stars. So that's my next slide. I got this star chat um, from a website. 
that I'm implementing. I have, I started implementing, so they have just one star each. And I love it because if you look at it, it says, I will. So the child sets their own goal. That's my reward chart. The child sets their own goal and says, oh, today I'm going to complete three um, school tasks. So that was what my son had said um, when I started it. He said, okay, today I'm going to complete three school tasks. And he was so dedicated. He finished one and said, okay, mommy, how many have I done now? I said one. He said, good. What's the next one? Which one should I do? Which one should I do? And he was so eager to complete the three because he was the one that set the goal. And by the time it was done, he was so proud of himself. <laughs> In fact, he told me now he's almost an adult. He's just six years old. <laughs> and I was wondering, what do you mean by you're almost an adult? He said, he's working like an adult. You know, he's doing difficult things. He's been able to achieve his goals. So he's, he's almost an adult. I said, okay, yes, you're almost an adult. Okay, but children get a lot of pride from setting their goals and achieving them. And then you can put the external stars to motivate them more. Because it's, it's beautiful when they look and they just see colors, okay? There are not so many white spaces anymore. I can see so many colors in my stars, okay? Um, still on the reward, aha. Uh -huh. Okay, so use some form of a system of reward for them. <laughs> if you look at these as well, you see my reward stickers. You have so many um, stickers for things that cite academic work. So don't just limit your work to just maths, English. There is I brushed my teeth, I played a game with my sibling, I spent some time exercising, you know, I read for 20 minutes. So there's a lot you could do, okay? Not just academic work, all right? So let's um, move on. Be consistent. I can't emphasize that and overemphasize that. Be consistent. It won't be easy. You won't see results immediately. But if you keep on doing the same things, you will start seeing results, OK? Just keep at it. Keep at it. Keep at it. Keep at it. And you'll begin to see the results. All right. Inconsistency lies the parts. Um, one um, of my mentors that says that inconsistency lies the power. Okay, um, the next tip will be get as many trustworthy people involved as possible. So um, at work as well, have a good relationship with your colleagues, your subordinates, your bosses, so that um, if you have to do something, your colleagues can cover up for you. You know, subordinates are able to you know keep up pace, even if you're not at hand for 30 minutes. Not the one that in 30 minutes you are not around and everything goes haywire. You know, your bosses as well, have a good working relationship with them. Not just um, only when you have achieved the task or only when you have faulted in a task. And do be as excellent as possible so that when you're saying, oh, I, I, I had to do something quickly, I'll be back and I'll do it. Your boss can trust you to achieve your goal, even if you take a 30 minutes break to go and watch your child, okay? Um, what's the next? Above all, believe in yourself. I put this because I realize that a lot of parents, a lot of parents get into the attitude of comparing themselves with others. So you see someone online, or maybe you go to my page and you decide, ah, oh, in fact, she's just the best me. I don't even know what I'm doing. You know, never compare yourself. Look, I like to tell people, you are the mother or the father of these children. God knew when he was giving the children to you and not to me or not to another parent, okay? He knew when he was giving the children to you. And I'm sure when he was giving them to you, he was not saying, ah, oh, in fact, this is a big mistake. It's a big mistake. Well, let me just give her. I am sure that's not how the baby came. I'm sure God did that with rejoicing. And I believe, I firmly believe that every child is suited, best suited to their parents, to be honest to their parents' temperament, the parents' style. You know, I believe that God has fitted you and your child with each other. So I cannot be a better parent to your child. Neither can you be a better parent to my child. I'm the best parent for my child. You are the best parent for your child. Believe that. And then you take steps to really put in the effort and get things done. Okay, so the last slide just has um, a resource I use um, I use this site called the School Run. It's um, a beautiful site. It's free. Registration is free. You get lots of worksheets, um, tips, lots of tips. 
Um, so for parents whose children school are not really doing something, you can get some insight from this um, school, the school run. So they tell you what a year one child should be able to do, what a year two child should be able to do in each of the subjects. So what a year one child should be doing in math, English, and science, what a year two child should be doing in math, English, and science, all the way to year six, I believe. Yes, year six, or even higher, but I'm not so sure because I, I deal with the primary. Okay, so they tell you what the child should be able to do in all the subjects for this for these classes. So it will help guide you as a parent. So you say, oh, my son doesn't know how to add in tens. So you know, okay, let me work on that with him. Um, also, you have some worksheets. They even recommend some sites <clears throat> where you can play games or your child can play games to help their math or their English or sites where they give some storybooks that you could download and read, okay? So I love the websites and I'm putting it up because well, it's free and we love free things. <laughs> Everyone loves free things. So you can check them up um, after this, okay? So a little bit, um, few other tips for you as a parent, you're working don't stress yourself out, really. Don't give yourself a headache. If, it's, if the work of the child is too much, then if, if it's overwhelming, then it's likely too much, okay? Your child will do well with just about 30 minutes of school work. If the child is in primary school, in between years one to, let's say, three, 30 minutes of school work would do a lot. One hour of school work would do a lot. Don't stress yourself to say, I want to do two hours. Okay, for a preschool child, you're not, you should even bother your head. Just go get some educational games and all of that. Um, yeah, I think those are the tips I'll leave you with. Um, waiting for questions, further questions on anything that has been discussed or has not been discussed so far. Okay, thank you for listening. Amazing, Kachi. Thank you very much. I mean, I have learned so, so much from everything you have said. You know, one thing that stuck in one of the things that, so many things stuck, but you know, the first thing that stuck is, if it is overwhelming, then it is too much, you know. We find out that schools these days, they send in a lot of tasks for the children. A two-year-old, a three-year-old doing some tasks, and I'm wondering, I beg, is this child in primary six or even GSS one? So it's good for parents to know that, you know, if it's overwhelming at this um, period, then it's too much. Um, then another thing for me is do not compare your child or yourself with another parent. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Do not compare your child or yourself with another child or another parent because your child is suited best for you and your suitors best for your child. So don't look at, uh, even among siblings, don't look at your sister's daughter or your sister's son and think that, oh, this person's son is better than my son because my son can do this or his son can do this and my son cannot do that. You know, It's yeah. unhealthy competition and it's not even good for the mind. So one question quickly before we go to the chat room, a few questions that I took down before we go into the chat room. Um, Homeschooling, like you have taught, rightly taught us, is not trying to do school at home. Yeah. It's not trying to um, um, bring in the school curriculum into the house and try to, okay, so we have assembly by seven o'clock and then we start, <laughs> and then we start by eight o'clock and then you go on break by 10 o'clock and all of that. Is it a COVID or post COVID nomenclature? Did it just start? Because you know, a lot of parents are new, are uh, quite new to this. All okay. of a sudden, there's COVID. Everybody has to sit at home, and then, oh, what do we do with the children? Ah, okay, let's homeschool them. Is mm -hmm. it as it existed before, or it was a COVID thing? It has existed long, long, long. In fact, since when we were children, oh, some okay. of our yeah, some of our mates in the Western world. Not, not necessarily in Nigeria or Africa, but in the Western world, some of our mates were homeschooled. They didn't go to a, um, a formal school, they were homeschooled. So it's been in existence for a long time. 
It's just um, coming into Nigeria or becoming more popular in Nigeria. Even before COVID, it was becoming it was becoming more, it was becoming more becoming more popular. Uh, two kids right here in Abuja. So, <coughs> excuse me. It was already becoming a bit popular. It's not a COVID or post-COVID thing or pre-COVID thing. It has nothing to do with COVID. It's all in existence, and that's why it's good to, you know, if you're new to this or you don't on you don't get the hang of it. Okay, you can Google homeschooling um, centers. You will have centers where you find centers that already have a homeschool curriculum. They can give you a suggested schedule, which you will find is totally different from the schedule schools are giving. So lots of schools are trying to do school at home. That's what a lot of, and that's why it's overwhelming for parents. It's not supposed to be that way. Homeschooling typically works on the principle that your child works when they are ready to work. So if they're not ready to work in the morning, they can't work. Leave them to work when they're ready to work, but ensure that they are working. At, you know, they are learning through the day. That's the idea. So really, it's not a COVID anything. It's always been in existence. You could Google some homeschooling sites that would help if you don't want to run your school curriculum. There are other ones coming up. I'm actually developing something still in the making, but something you know that will work with parents because a lot of parents are complaining in this season. And that's because schools are getting it wrong. Some schools are getting it right, really. Um, just that some parents don't know those schools. I know quite some schools that are getting it right. Uh, so yeah, I think that answers that. Okay, beautiful. Okay, so I now want to find out, you know, some parents are like, okay, we can deal with this as long as we know when all of this will be over. When there will not be locked down anymore, when our children can go to school. So I began to think to myself, what happens if this becomes the new normal? Mm. You know, it's okay to say, okay, I can deal with this for, for the next three months. I can deal with this for the next four months. But what happens if I have to now do this on a consistent basis for a year, two years, you know? So what mindset should parents have right now? You know, are, are we supposed to view it as a short-term thing, put in short-term measures? You know, are we supposed to view, you know, the, because like I used to tell people, they used to tell us, think outside the box, think outside the box. Now, the box has been destroyed. There is no box anymore. So what mindset should, what mindset should parents have, you know, attacking or maybe attacking is, an, is not the right word, but, you know, um, accommodating this into their new system of, of, of life and stuff. Okay, that's a beautiful, beautiful, very beautiful question. Because if I will go by, you see, history is a good teacher. So let me just help parents here. If you will go by history, the history of um, pandemics that have come, for every pandemic that comes in, there is a, a likely comeback in the immediate, okay? It might not be as severe as the first, but there is a very likely comeback. So <laughs> just, Prepare for the long haul. Let me just put it that way. <laughs> Prepare for the long haul. Okay. That's the truth. It, it yeah. would be beautiful if we could all go back to normal and schools could resume. But the truth is how many parents would even be safe and comfortable sending their children to school if they call for school to resume today? Would you be so comfortable to take them to school and you know have them interact with teachers and other students? You might not be. So just prepare for the long haul. That's one. Then two. That is why I started with saying, is it worth it? Now, the worth of this homeschooling is not necessarily in the academic achievement. I think if you can look beyond the academic achievement to the things, the work ethics that will be achieved, which will help you even in academic. Okay, so let me give you an example. If you are able to get your child, who is perhaps six, seven year old now, to work independently, during this COVID season, and then we resume school, say, next year. Do you realize that when they resume school next year, your child will be able to do homework on their own? Your child will be able to study on their own. So you can go to work and say, be 
you know, have a good sound mind while at work, not thinking of whether your child has done the homework or whether the homework was correct. Mm. You just know that your child would do that work. <laughs> your child is going to secondary school or perhaps you want your child to school not in this country. You're not thinking of whether the child has woken up to read at night. You know, you're sure your child has a good work ethic. Think of it that way. You can have a child who you won't bother chasing around for homework after this. The child will grow knowing what to do at the right time and actually doing it. And knowing that, oh, if I don't do this, I won't get good scores. And wanting to achieve the good scores for himself or for herself, not because mom and dad says, I should just do it and they want me to get 10 out of 10. They would want to get it for their own self with their own motivation. It saves you a lot of stress, to be honest, a lot of stress. It saves you. So it's beyond just now. It's, mm. It goes on to achieving those work ethics within in your child that the child will grow up with and then become an adult with those work ethics. And then you have an adult that everyone is saying, wow, this is your, your child, your teenager is so on point, you know, I will we do the work at the right time, go and play a game at the right time, know where to stop the games. Do you know how many headaches <laughs> teenagers cause their parents? Because they decide that I want to play game all day. And you know, you've, you've never trained them to understand that we should work at certain times and we should you know, do some play at certain times. So the goal of this is achieving independence in your child. Let your child learn to become independent regardless of the situation, regardless of where they find themselves, regardless of whether another pandemic happens or not, they are independent and they know the worth of learning. They know the importance of work. You know, they get to just learn all these things. So I think we should just take our minds off um, whether we'll continue this forever or not to helping our children achieve these soft skills, um, work ethics and values, that will take them through life. I think that's what I would recommend to every parent. Beautiful. So everybody on this call, this is the public service announcement. We're in this <laughs> long haul. <laughs> yeah, long haul. Attention to to um, building value in your child or your as against getting your, your child's mathematics on point or getting his English on that, point, you know build your child's moral muscles you know yeah. focus on making your child an independent child you know for your own good and for the good of the society you don't want an indisciplined child now i'm um, speaking about discipline for me uh, i'm not a parent yet but i have three nephews and um you know i see how sometimes all you want to do is just beat this child and just you know put it just let me be, I beg, I am busy and all of that. So parents need to know where and how to draw the line between discipline and punishment and where to use what, when to use what. Can you, you know, give us some um, scenarios? Because, you know, it was very beautiful you saying that it's better um, discipline against punishment because some parents don't even know the, I remember growing up, you know, in school, your teacher would say, I would discipline you. And that equates, uh, exactly. So how do we draw the line? And when should we use what? Should we eradicate punishment completely? What's, what exactly is discipline? What exactly is punishment? You know, I think parents need to know that and be more, is, can you shed more light on that, please? Okay, um, I will just use what I do as a guide. Um, also get books and learn a lot. Okay, but what I do is this. Your child, as your child is, think of your child as an adult from where you are. Think of the adult you want the child to become. Okay? Now, whatever value or... Um, whatever ethic you want to see in your adult child, you have to instill such discipline now. Okay. So if, for example, I want to see my child being able, or a very simple one, I want to see my adult child as one that is um, empathic. 
one with good emotional intelligence, okay? And then I'm going to start to um, think of ways to embed that in my child. Now, that is where the discipline comes in. And so you're going to, you're looking at everything the child does with the mindset of who you want the child to be, not just the fact that you want peace. I think that's where the difference is. So a lot of times parents are with their children based on the fact that I just want peace. Huh. Or how can you do that? Children don't act that way. <laughs> or your child is not like that. You get, it's, 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 not, it's beyond that. Think of the adult you want that child to be. And then every other thing that goes on, you should you know, work with your child to be able to get that goal. Okay. For some people, look, discipline is different for every child and everybody. And that's why you read of maybe a big artist. I've forgotten what Adil that was now, who said he spilled milk or he broke a glass and there was milk in it and he spilled on the ground. And um, he was at first you know, startled and afraid. And then his mom came and said, oh, look at this. Look at the spilled milk again. It looks so artistic. It looks like this. It looks like that. It sounds weird to the African parents, Amazing. but that was where, yeah, that was where his art career began. Okay, so you you really you can't you can't make a a principle or how do I put it? You can't build your house based on people's experiences because everybody has a different idea of what they want their child to be as an adult. I want my child to be emotionally intelligent. I, it's something that's important to me. I want them to be able to understand people not just talk anyhow, being brash, you know, doing all that. I want them to be able to communicate. So when I'm working with my children, I do a lot of talking to them. I do a lot of, you know, trying to know, how do you think that made this person feel? How do you think I feel? How do you, how do you feel about this? You know, I do a lot of that. And it guides me, instead of being angry about some things, you know, I just realize, okay. But in fact, I, I don't have to think two times about it. I just let why would you do that? How does it make me feel? Do you know? And my son has speaking so much that I mean, I'm now, I'm thinking I've gone overboard because every time he does something wrong, he can cry for two hours straight. Not because we beat him. We did not beat him, but he's feeling bad. How can I do that type of thing? Ah, and this person will feel bad. How could I have done? He now is picking it up, but I deliberately put him. Now that is the discipline part. There are times when I use punishment, and I'll tell you when I, that's my principle, really. It's different for everybody. My principle. I use punishment for things that, how do I put it? There are some values I think are key to me because I believe they are key for, you know, based on my religion, I believe they are key for growing up in that. So, for example, I don't want a child telling lies, okay? Uh, I could use punishment if you tell a lie. And if you tell me the truth, you really don't get punished. So that's how it is in the house. So if you do something wrong, you know that you should come and tell me immediately. I might scold you, but you know, nothing goes on. But if you don't tell me or you tell a lie about it, then you definitely get punished. Because I want them to get into, not to get into the attitude of telling lies. Now lying is not, it doesn't have a consequence really. So I can't say I'm waiting for, you know, the consequence of lying to catch up with them before you get, it doesn't have a consequence. And that is why I use the punishment for it. And I feel it's a value that is really deep for me. Okay. It differs for different parents. And the punishment is always, they know the punishment. In fact, they can begin the punishment before I get there. That's how, <laughs> yes. So sometimes my son has something, he just goes to the floor, kneels down. I raise up his hand and I'm like, okay, what did you do? And then he confesses and so he get up and go because you know you took on the initiative to do that. So it differs, but the idea is have the big vision for your child, not just let me have peace. Don't get into the let me have peace parenting. Mm. Get into the vision. What what do you want from your child? What adults do you want your child to be? As an adult, how do you want them to act? Now, when you think of those things, you realize that they need to be thought taught those things. A lot of times children misbehave because they really don't know. And because we are just focused on having our own peace, we forget to teach them. We think the punishment will teach them. No. But when you're thinking of the adult you want that child to be, you realize, oh, let me teach you now. You shouldn't oh. hit this other child because 
how do you think the child will feel? Do you understand? Mm -hmm. Or you want your child to be a strong leader. You're like, no, you can't be crying when everybody is, uh, you did this and you are crying. No, no, we don't do that. You're a leader. You can be an influence. And you are teaching your child because you have a big vision for that child. <laughs> Excuse me. All so right. I think this, the, the, or the key lies in having a big vision for your child. And then you work from there. Then you know what to do, how to teach the child these things, how to instill the discipline, how to make them get to learn this and to understand this. And then your punishment, you can restrict it to some values that you believe are key. Values maybe equal, for some people, it could be timekeeping. You just want a child that keeps to time and it becomes a strong thing for them. But you know, minimize it, minimize it as much as possible. And if you're going to use punishment, make sure it is stipulated and it's not based on your anger or how you feel. So my punishment can never go past, kneel down, raise your hand. And there is a time limit for it. My spanking at some point, and at an age I stopped spanking. But before that age, I think I stopped around six, so I don't spank my son as much. But I spank you according to your age. So if you're one year, <laughs> if you're one year old, you get one stroke. If you're two years, you get two stroke. And it's with a dedicated tiny stick like that that you cannot. As in, it's tiny. It's too tiny for you to say what to use force. That's the idea. Because you could get angry and do some silly things. Okay, but let it be clear. Okay, this is this is just it. All right. This is punishment for this. And everybody knows you cannot go past that. You cannot say, I'm too angry. So I decided to tell you to carry stone on your head. Uh, Let it thank you very much, Kachi. I am so enjoying this conversation. I wanted to continue, but we're running out of time. So parents, one quick one that we took from this is, begin with the end in mind, in the words of Stephen Kobe. how do you want your child to be in the future? And start grooming and training that child to be that individual that you see in the future. Um, I can see something in the chat. Doris says she wants the video, the recording. Don't worry, you'll get that on our page. Just stay tuned to us. And good news, everybody. This is not just a one-time thing. We're continuing with this next week. So you can sure keep a date with us. We'll communicate you know, that on our other social media platforms. If you have any other question, you know, you can send us a, an email at dreambodinitiative at gmail.com or reach out to us on Instagram at dreambodinitiative. You know, we would be sure and we'll be happy to take your questions. Yes, thank you very much. For those that came in late, this is um, a webinar organized by Dreambody Initiative. It's a non-governmental organization and our goal, you know, is to stimulate the creative minds of, of young people or students, you know, and we use education as our major tool. And we are having this conversation today because our education sector has been hit badly and we need to, you know, recover quickly from this. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Kachi. We are so grateful to have you. I have learned a lot from this. I am going to sit down with these slides and I am going to chew on them, you know, to make me a better auntie. I have three nephews and, you know, I see great minds, you know, I see world leaders, so I need to start addressing them. Your excellency, sir, we don't behave like that in the, <laughs> we don't behave like that in the White House. We don't behave like that in Asso Rock, no. We don't talk to people like that, no. <laughs> we can't afford to do that, no. So, you know, I'm so excited and, you know, these are valuable lessons that we can um, use practically and thank you for making it as, easy and as um, simple as as you have done we are so grateful thank you everybody for being a part of, of this session i am so excited it's our maiden edition and i mean we have we have all of you here the love is enormous thank you so much god bless you